the final uh, panel, but not the final presentation of our conference today. Our panel is called Toward a Progressive Unionism. Um, we will be sharing this space for the next hour and 45 minutes or so, and then turning it over to our final discussion with Josh Freeman himself to cap off what has been a provocative and informative day. Um, I wanna thank everybody who has spoken at the conference today. I, everyone who's in the audience and who's been with us, you know, any part of the day or all of the day or just joining us right now. Um, as we have this presentation, you should feel free to post any uh, questions that you have in the chat. Um, we are going, I'm going to be introducing the panel, making a few introductory comments, um, and then uh, we'll hear from the panelists and we will have, I hope, lots of time for audience questions. So please feel free to post them throughout and we will get to them at the end. Um, like many of us who uh, have spoken today, I wanna start <laughs> Um, with acknowledging Josh. Uh, as his former student and colleague, I feel vast personal and intellectual gratitude to Josh that exceeds the influence of the work that we're focused on today, Working Class New York. Um, but for this book alone, I feel like genuinely beholden to him. I teach about New York City, I write about New York City, I just completed a book, uh, The People's Guide to New York City with my colleagues, Carolina Bank Munoz and Emily Molina at Brooklyn College. And Josh contributed to that book and advised us on that book. Um, and the insights, the detail, the sweep and the arguments of working class New York have fundamentally shaped my understanding of my hometown in all of these endeavors and really every day um, uh, living here. Um, and again, you know, many have spoken to this and I'm echoing uh, what they said, but, but most of us have spoken to this in relation to our careers as scholars. And I wanna focus about the context in which I first uh, read this, which was, even though I was already a graduate student, I first read the book as part of a book group with other union organizers. Um, it was organizers, it was organized by a, a researcher at, I think, HERE. Um, and some of us were rank and file organizers, many of us were staffers. We met at the old international bar down on First Avenue and got together and discussed this book. Um, and for this group coming from multiple unions in the city, uh, coming you know, with, with different kind of uh, experience in the labor movement, most of us from New York, reading Working Class New York had the effect of lifting a distracting veil that had shrouded our perceptions of the city that we were trying to change. Um, Kim Phillips Fine spoke about this at the beginning of the day that, you know, the stories of New York about, you know, the, the glitz, the glamour, the real estate titans, the, you know, financial princes, the money, you know, that is the story of New York. And reading Working Class New York was like, like finding a city that was hiding in plain sight, you know, one that we had not yet been able to piece together on our own, certainly, and not without Josh's extraordinary synthesis and research and storytelling detail. Um, so suddenly our disparate struggles had a connected history, an arc, and critically a potential for power that we had not reckoned with um, before reading this book. And it made an enormous impact on all of us that we spoke about that night. Um, and, and after many years of continued study and continued active involvement in our city's labor movement, I still return to this book. Um, as for me, it is New York's right and real and essential history. Um, it's the book that I assign every semester in my work culture and politics class, because I don't think we can understand New York without it. Beyond just understanding New York, um, the human and grounded scale of Josh's history brought my fellow organizers way back then and the organizers uh, that I helped to teach today to also care about our city more deeply, to hold faith in it and to expect more from it. Um, this was true 20 years ago when, as Johanna Fernandez and Samir Santi and others spoke about, 
unions and class had largely disappeared from the public discourse and we were watching the city be stripped of its working class institutions and culture. And it's true today for my students who are growing up in a city that too often displaces them and makes them struggle as they try to make it a better place. Um, so I think we all stick with our efforts because we care and Josh's book helps lead us to that care. Jack described it as touching. And I think that that is you know, spot on. Um, uh, Jack Metzger earlier today. Um, so anyway, this book has been generative for the scholars that we've heard from, but it also continues to animate activists and organizers on the ground as the present and the future of the city feel all the more vital when we appreciate the past uh, that Josh reveals. Um, it's to that future that our panel is going to turn. And I'm just gonna say a few introductory contextual comments for the panel um, and the subject of the panel, and then we'll turn to our panelists. Um, it's, it's both an exciting and daunting time to be discussing the future of progressive urbanism. Um, at the opening of today's conference, Samir Santi no noted that despite the pandemic and its catastrophic effects, a fiscal crisis like the one that New York City experienced in the 1970s has been held off by federal support. Um, you know, Biden did not follow Ford in saying drop dead to New York City. Um, but I'm less sanguine about at least the short and medium term future of the city. The city is still undergoing extreme trauma with many of our communities scarred by excess death illness, unemployment. Looking just at that last bit, uh, the Independent Budget Office reports that New York City lost nearly 20% of its jobs in the first quarters of the pandemic. And while there's been a slight recovery, I mean, you know, a, a these, hundreds of thousands of jobs added, the over half a million jobs um, that are still lost is still the single, uh, the, the single biggest decline in one year in our history. And the IBO projects a quote, slow and fragile recovery over the next five years. Overall income has stayed up and the incredible recent victory that we had uh, for excluded workers in New York state and the extension of unemployment benefits and stimulus payments will buoy communities for now, um, buoy. Uh, but retail, food service, hospitality, entertainment, some of our biggest and in some cases previously fastest growing industries will be hurt for years and be permanently transformed. High office vacancy rates will push down commercial property values um, and from their tax revenue and of course transform the neighborhoods and the streetscapes where fewer people will gather every day. Uh, while there's a good chance that real estate um, in the residential area will do okay, um, which again is, will remain largely unaffordable for uh, working class New York, um, we are a city of tenants and the rent will come due. Meanwhile, Wall Street has had a banner year. Um, you know, these are some of the facts of New York at this instant, and I raise them to put our conversation in some context of the indeterminate nature, certainly in the shorter and medium term, prospects for our city. And also to suggest that while New York City has it bad, and in many ways, you know, worse in this country, um, in relation to the things I just named, not, not the worst in many other ways, uh, uh, there are many cities that are finding themselves in and will find themselves in similar straits in the near term because we are thinking about progressive urbanism at a larger scale. Um, but of course, there is optimistic context as well as our panel description alludes to. Um, in, in recent years, cities have indeed been, as our panel description promises, a progressive, a center for progressive action in the United States. Um, in recent years, we've seen cities across the country put forward exciting political and policy successes, pushing against austerity, uh, the deregulated and fissured workplace that we've heard about a bit today. Um, and the erosion of social democratic public sector gains that we have spent a lot of time speaking about. 
The fight for, 15, for 15, the minimum wage, took off in New York first, then Seattle, Chicago. Um, again, just speaking about this city, paid sick leave, fair scheduling, just cause firing, universal pre-K, expanded rights for tenants. I mean, these are some of the policy changes covering millions of working families enacted in New York City through collective pressure of community and union coalitions and the election of progressive city council members um, just in, you know, in, in recent years. Um, and again, this kind of upsurge and this progressive realignment at the political level, at the local level, has happened in numerous cities in both the United States, around this uh, country, and, and really around the globe. So if our cities, our city and others hang a little bit in the balance right now, if this is a critical period, which I believe it is for the next few years, um, in terms of who successfully takes advantage of the crisis that we are uh, facing, you know, what is the future for progressive urbanism? Does the local scale of organizing continue to capture and make progress in the face of international upheavals like the pandemic? What initiatives, strategies, tactics, campaigns, and policies should we be pursuing? Um, who are now and who will be the agents of these changes? What can we learn from the past, from New York's past and from cities beyond New York? And of course, um, this is also very many ways of saying, how have, what we how have what we've learned from Josh's work help us to understand and answer these questions? Really to answer. Um, so I'm gonna now turn to our panel of scholar practitioners. These are four um, uh, uh, folks with great ideas, but also feet firmly planted on the ground. Um, and, uh, who also all bring a great deal of care about cities and New York um, into their work and their comments. Um, I'm gonna give all the uh, bios and then they will speak in turn. Um, so we're gonna begin with Nikhil Saval. Uh, uh, senator Saval is a state senator representing the first district in Pennsylvania. He's a former New Yorker of, of some time and we lost him to, to Philly. Um, uh, he is a former co-editor uh, co of the journal N Plus One, and he's also the author of Cubed, A Secret History of the Workplace. We will then turn to Francis Piven, who's Professor Emeritus at the CUNY Graduate Center, and also we're thankful to say at the School of Labor and Urban Studies. Um, she is the author of numerous nationally and internationally renowned books, including Poor People's Movements, Regulating the Poor, why Americans Don't Vote, Why Americans Still Don't Vote, <laughs> um, Challenging Authority, and, and more. Um, she did not write this, but Francis's intellectual and practical leadership over many decades have helped to forge, among other things, what we have of a progressive urbanism in this city and the country. So we are grateful to be hearing from you, Francis. Um, Marta Gutman, uh, we'll be speaking next. Uh, Marta is an architectural historian and a licensed architect. She teaches at the Spitzer School of Architecture at the City College of New York, as well as at the Graduate Center. And in her work, she examines ordinary buildings and neighborhoods, the history of cities and issues of gender, class, race, and especially childhood as they play out in everyday spaces, public culture, and social life. She is the author of the award-winning A City for Children, Women, Architecture, and the Charitable Landscapes of Oakland, 1850 to 1950. And her work um, has appeared in the recent collection, Educating Harlem, A Century of Schooling and Resistance in a Black Community. Her current book project, uh, titled Just Space, Modern Architecture, Public Education, and School Desegregation in Post-War Urban America, comes out of her research for that collection I just named and it informs her presentation today. Um, Kefwi Otto is uh, our last but, but not least uh, speaker. He is our fantastic um, colleague at the School of Labor and Urban Studies where he is 
an associate professor of urban studies. Um, Kafui is the author of Rights in Transit, Public Transportation and the Right to the City in California's East Bay. So it seems like we could have a conversation about, about bay, the Bay politics in this panel if we wanted to move in that direction. Um, and his work has appeared in Urban Studies, Society and Space, Progress uh, in Human Geography, New Labor Forum, um, as well as multiple other journals and popular uh, venues. So um, with that, I would like to turn it over to Nikhil. Thank you so much, um, Professor Lewis. Thank you to, uh, to CUNY to, for, for having me um, to, to all just to be really an honor to be on this very distinguished panel and um, certainly to be speaking in, at a conference in honor of a of, of phenomenal book um, about which, uh, you know, which I read when I was still a New Yorker, um, I, I have been lost to Philadelphia, but, um, but, or, or, and, you know, but nonetheless, just learned so much from it. Um, in particular, the, it, you know, its central thesis, which will be part of what I speak about, which is just the, the role of the labor movement in constructing a, a, a sort of social democratic polity um, in, in, in a city, in a municipal context. And so um, one thing that, uh, that Professor that Joshua Freeman spoke about is, or he, get, he gets into a little bit, is the role of the labor movement in creating, um, in essentially the public housing movements of the in, in, issuing out of the 1930s um, and continuing. And, I, and there is, and, and what I'm gonna talk about here is a little bit of uh, that history and maybe what we might take from it. Um, but in Philadelphia, we have a saying, which is keep New York out of Philadelphia. So I am going to be um, speaking about Philly a little bit at the very beginning, and, and, but hopefully with lessons too that um, have relevance to, to, um, to New York and to other cities. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, let's see. Share to know does that work? Did, no, that didn't quite work. Let's try this again. There we go. Um, I believe people can see that. So, um, so my talk is called "Housing the Public," um, and uh, in the depths in 1934, in the depths of the Great Depression. Activists and organized for a new public housing model gathered at 2021 Chancellor Street in Philadelphia. The Labor Housing Conference, as it was called, counted the head of the Philadelphia Building Trades Council as its chair, and the organization's proposals for building multifamily housing units would directly benefit laborers in the construction industry. But the intellectual motivating force behind the conference was Catherine Bauer, seen here, author of the seminal 1934 book. Modern Housing, one of the most powerful advocates for the broad government provision of housing that the United States has seen. Um, a student of the modern movement in architecture, Bauer had traveled extensively in Europe to witness the growing union of functionalist architecture and social housing, as well as the muscular interventions made by mu municipalities to build housing where the private market had failed. In Frankfurt, for example, this is an image of Frankfurt social housing, the government had built 160,000 units of new housing, enough to house just 10% of the pop, enough to house it, you know, over 10% of the population. In the view of Bauer and many others, the United States needed just such a building program to solve an endemic housing crisis, which predated but was exacerbated by the Great Depression. The Labor Housing Conference in Philadelphia proposed the creation of a United States housing authority whose purpose was to construct, and, and this is uh, in the language of one um, bill, uh, one of the pieces of legislation um, that issued out of this, to construct and aid in the construction of modern large-scale housing available to those families who in good as well as bad times cannot afford to pay the price which will induce the ordinary and usual channels of private enterprise to build such housing. In addition to direct interventions by the federal government, Bauer and members of the Labor Housing Conference supported grant making 
and loans to non-governmental housing agencies, such as cooperatives and other types of non-commercial housing organizations. Given that a shortfall in supply was the ultimate cause of the housing crisis, they recognized that a panoply of strategies was necessary to produce sufficient housing, especially subsidized housing for working and middle-class people. One of the examples of cooperative housing that Bauer and advocates admired was the Carl Mackley Houses in North Philadelphia, a multifamily housing complex built by modernist architects Oscar Stonerov and Alfred Kastner for hosiery workers, which broke with the row house typology that otherwise dominated the city. And this is um, Stonerov and Kastner. Um, this is actually a, um, a rally for the killed Carl Mackley, a hosiery worker. Uh, in, in North Philadelphia, which out of which issued this call to build housing for, for hosiery workers. Um, and there is the Carl Mackley homes. No longer quite looks like that, but it was, this is uh, the 1930s. Um, the labor housing conferences attempt to secure a European style social housing program for the United States led to the passage of the Housing Act of 1937. This seminal legislation, which paved the way for post-war public housing in the United States was a triumph of the movement that Bauer had helped lead. It nonetheless had several critical omissions and qualifications that would make American public housing distinct from its European counterparts. The 1937 Housing Act did not contain the provision on nonprofits and cooperatives that the Labor Housing Conference fought for. It also limited itself to the lowest income groups and mandated that housing construction would require faithfully slum clearance in equal proportion. Finally, an amendment by Senator Harry Byrd placed a cap on costs that dashed the design hopes of Bauer and other forward-thinking architects and critics. The bill solidified what historian Gail Radford has called the two tiers of American housing policy. One tier in which the federal government subsidizes through highway expansion and tax credits, the growth of single family suburban homes, and the other lower tier in which it offers a comparatively paltry subsidy to low-income people. That same year the bill passed, the Philadelphia Housing Authority was created by the Pennsylvania legislature following similar housing authorities all over the country. And in the years to come, especially in the 1950s, the construction of public housing and the clearance of slums would begin in earnest. That a path for a European style social housing program was lost in America is not simply of antiquarian or romantic interest. It laid the groundwork for the conditions that planners, advocates, and legislators confront actively. The narrow form that American public housing took, a jobs program first and a housing program second, paved the way for its political defeat and eventual dissolution. Bauer foresaw, and in the 1950s, in, in an article pictured here, publicly lamented, I believe this is an architectural forum, um, the outcomes that an American public housing approach in, involving destructive slum clearance dependent on government provision and limited to low-income dwellers would produce. Deeply racially segregated, low-quality housing that suffered from disinvestment and neglect, failed to meet demand, and which generated opposition both from within and without. By the 1960s and 1970s, many progressives opposed public housing and the demolition required to create it, Consider it, considering it a failure on its own terms and following the Jane Jacobs and Oscar Newman, um, here pictured uh, Oscar Newman, the, the uh, theorist of defensible space, the notion that public housing in the form of public housing was, was crimogenic. Um, uh, so rat, many people considered it a failure on its own terms and a generator of urban crime. Um, Oscar Newman's theories became very popular. This is an image of correlating density um, to robberies and from a UK television program on his work. Um, and a recent spate of scholarship has noted how an unlikely coalition of environmentalists, preservationists, um, and anti-freeway act activists created a low or anti-growth regime in American cities leading to an overall diminution in public housing and even hostility to much new housing altogether. President Nixon's signing of the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 was the start of a new era in the history of housing policy in the United States. Rooted in the premise that the private sector was better equipped to handle the production and management of housing 
the public sector's role was limited to provide, providing the minimal viable subsidy necessary for low-income residents to remain housed. A suite of new funding solutions, vouchers paid to private landlords, block grants administered by municipalities, and tax relief to businesses that invested in housing projects solidified a decentralized system of affordable housing development carried out by an amalgamation of private, nonprofit, and public actors throughout the country. The results of this decentralized system, much like the promise of public housing before it, has been disappointing. Housing vouchers, which were meant to increase access to safer streets, higher wages, and better resource schools, carry a similar stigma to the housing projects they were designed to replace. Tax credits do not provide a deep enough subsidy for new construction units to be affordable to the lowest income tenants. And neither has solved the truly American legacy of American residential, excuse me, of residential segregation by race. As we emerge, however, haltingly and unevenly from a brutal pandemic, we can glean some lessons from this dispiriting history. The public housing movement of the 1930s sought to unite and attack on the undersupply of affordable housing with the latest techniques in modern architecture and with the buy-in of organized labor. A contemporary project must again be carried out in collaboration with labor, but this time as an ecologically minded, environmentally sustainable housing program that mitigates utility burdens and advances overall goals of decarbonization. The 1970s progressive opposition to the project of public housing was a reaction, as has been rehearsed many times, to the top-down policymaking of the urban renewal era that tore apart the fabric of our cities. The low-income housing tax credit program that eventually emerged from this period exhibited a strength that American public housing, despite the advocacy of figures like Bauer, lacked sound construction built of a quality that, in most instances, is above the standards of comparative comparably priced units available on the private market a quality that will be of utmost importance for a new federal infrastructure investment that we foresee of unprecedented size. This time, however, I argue investments should not be hidden within reams of legalese, shoehorned into odd provisions within the tax code as it has occurred previously. Instead, we should use federal dollars granted by state and local governments to pay builders, laborers, and architects strong wages and competitive salaries to build beautiful, sustainable homes and public spaces that mitigate the harms Americans enact on the planet. This must be housing built with public dollars by those earning living wages. It must be housing owned by a network of public housing authorities, municipalities, cooperatives, and land trusts. Um, this is actually an image I'll just point out of a, of a, um, a housing encampment uh, near the art museum in Philadelphia. So one of the richer neighborhoods in the city that eventually prompted the city of Philadelphia to give uh, about several uh, dozen units from its housing authority over to a, a land trust, um, which as many people will know, the notion of a community land trust comes out of um, cooperative movements, uh, largely black radical cooperative movements in, in the South. Um, so, uh, just in, and this uh, is an is an example from New York City. I do conceive this much um, via Verde in the Bronx, which is an image of um, green social housing, one of the one of the better um, productions of, of green social housing in the United or of affordable housing in the United States. Um, so, uh, as I said, it should be owned by a network of public housing authorities, municipalities, cooperatives, and land trusts, affordable in perpetuity and only changing hands and owners as necessary to meet the moment needs and desires of those living within it. The process we use to conceptualize the future of our built environment must meet the needs of most residents rather than reflecting the desires of the loudest neighbor or the most politically connected developer. A contemporary project, if it is to reckon adequately with the fact housing markets have been responsible for the unequal distribution, not just of housing, but of wealth, education, public services, employment, and social and physical and psychological well being must be comprehensive. It must provide a public alternative to market rate housing within a context of raised living standards that are, at the very least, equal to those enjoyed by affluent residents of the surrounding suburbs. Nearly 80 years ago, housing advocates in Philadelphia embarked on an abortive project to solve a housing crisis that has ramified and deepened. Resuming that project means not only honoring its original ambition 
but it's creativity. Every possible tool will be necessary to ensure that people are equitably, justly, and sustainably housed. Thank you so much. Nikhil, thank you um, so much uh, for that great presentation. And um, we are now going to hear from Francis. I want to say first that I'm really happy, pleased to be part of this event honoring my longtime friend, Josh, and his work, and to join with my other friends from the Murphy Institute, from the School of Labor and Urban Studies, in celebrating Josh, the occasion of his retirement, and his uh, marvelous book on working class New York. But I want to begin my, uh, answering my charge, which is to talk about the future of a progressive urbanism in New York. I want to begin by talking about what I think is the key element in the possibility of a progressive urbanism or the possibility of a social democratic city in the future. You know, for since the middle of the 19th century, the left has depended on an idea about working class power. That has been the animating uh, fuel of the left and has given it morale. And that idea is simply that workers have power in capitalist societies. They have power because capitalists depend on workers, because nothing functions in a tightly interdependent society, unless workers cooperate, uh, unless workers make a contribution. You can't run factories, you can't run traffic, unless workers play their assigned role. And because they have to play their assigned role, they can also refuse to play their assigned role. They can engage in what we have celebrated as the strike, but a strike that takes many forms, a strike that is essentially the refusal of participation. Now, the importance of this insight to the labor movement is partly that it reflected the actual power that workers have in production and in urban life, and partly also that recognizing this power enhanced it because most of the time people don't recognize the power that they have in dense social relations. That made possible the building of the union movement and it also made possible the building of working class New York. Now of late in the last 20, 25 years, there is a widespread sense that this classical worker power is evaporating because of globalization and because of robotization. That because capital is so mobile, because it can go anywhere, because there are endless numbers of workers available anywhere from the Middle East to India to China, workers have lost the power that comes from the dependence of capital on labor power. That's one of the reasons, but the other reason is also that capitalists have developed strategies to take advantage of the mobility that comes with globalization and with robotization and strategies such as those that were visible in the Amazon strike in Bessemer, Alabama. That strike was lost, not exactly because workers no longer had power, but because the company, Jeff Bezos, contrived to change the bargaining unit. That's the same as uh, gerrymandering in politics. And, and contrived also to influence through uh, command meetings with the workers to scare them because the company was watching them every minute. So 
what we have to worry a lot about what is the working class strategy to counter the effect of globalization, robotization, and capitalist manipulation. And I think to discover this kind of this this strategy, the strategy that recovers power, we have to look at workers' role, the work, role of workers in other institutions rather than the institutions of production, which we have mainly fastened on in, in the past and, the, and go, go beyond the production strike <coughs> In, in contemplating worker actions to demonstrate their power. One way to do this is to look at the distinctive forms of economic exchange in a global economy, extended chains of production, just-in-time production, and the capacity to use the same strike action, the same refusal, the same withdrawal of cooperation to exercise leverage in those relations. But I wanted to point to another avenue of power recovery uh, that has also gotten a lot of attention recently in labor circles. And that is to look beyond the workplace for complementary sources of strike power. We saw that dramatically in the teacher strikes that spread from West Virginia through the South of the United States. Beginning, by the way, in Chicago, beginning in one of the largest cities in the United States. Those teacher strikes were made possible because teachers reached out to the community, reached out to parents because they worried about the children, because they worried that the children would not get their lunches and their breakfasts if they went on strike and they compensated for that loss. They formed an alliance with the community that made the teachers strike as powerful as it was so that the teachers won in Chicago. And because they won in Chicago, the teacher strike spread through the South of the United States. The other way in which the same kind of, the same avenue to the recovery of worker power is being pursued, I think, is through the idea of bargaining for the common good. What bargaining for the common good means specifically is the forming of alliances with the community based on goals, policy goals that are shared between labor unions or emerging labor unions and community groups. With that in mind, I want to come back to New York and what the future, actually the near future of New York holds as a promise for progressive urbanism. I think that to do that, I wanna shift from strike, labor strikes to rent strikes. I think that New York right now is, or working people in New York right now, are positioned to take advantage of another kind of interdependence, not the interdependence between workers and factory owners or workers and uh, Amazon centers, but the interdependence between renters and landlords. I mean, look at what has happened in New York, a city of renters in which incomes have been interrupted or reduced so that rent has not been paid. There have been temporary uh, measures passed by the Center for Disease Control, by state legislatures to try to keep the ceiling from falling down on us. The temporary measures 
forbid evictions, but how long can that go on? People don't have the money to pay the back rent and to pay the future rent. In a city where real estate is an incredibly big industry and real estate is intertwined with finance, people are going to confront this major challenge of not being able to pay back rent, and maybe they would be, therefore be available for a big organized rent strike. Now, in the history of New York, there have been a lot of rent strikes. That has been, in fact, the most effective form of tenant action. Where did we get whatever reforms we've had uh, that, for example, put legal constraints on what landlords can do when tenants strike? Where did that come from? It came from historic rent strikes that go way back before the Great Depression, but were very important in the Great Depression itself when communists marched through the streets of New York, calling out the neighbors to put the furniture back in the apartment of people who were being evicted. And they came out. And then the, the, there was a journal put out by the Communist Party called The Communist, uh, which suggested that the comrades ought to position themselves on the outside of the crowd, blocking the sheriff or blocking the cops from going forward with the eviction because the comrade should take the blows of the cops and the sheriffs first. The rent strikes were effective in the 1930s. They stopped evictions. We're gonna have to figure out if, if that's the path we wanna take now in this propitious moment. You know, in December, there was a report that there was $70 billion in unpaid rent in the United States. We can humiliate those people. That's the way the legal process works. We can force them to bankrupt themselves to try to hold on to what they have of the home. Or we can politicize this real calamity of people losing their homes. And by politicizing it, create an opportunity for a different, different kind of housing. The opportunity for a different kind of housing, we should call for the expropriation of private housing. You know, in Berlin, the activists are calling now for expropriation. We should make housing a public good. We should, and we, we don't, I think we have to be a little wary of the little schemes that, that have been tried in the past, like with in-rem housing in New York, where tenants are supposed to somehow find the money to, and the energy and the skills and the information to run the housing themselves. Let's make it public and provide ample opportunities for tenants to participate in the administration of that part of the public sector. If we did that, I think we would revive in New York City and in other big cities, we would revive the confidence in the possibility of worker power because tenants are workers that animated the worker, the work, the working class described in uh, Josh's book and gives us the kind of power that gives morale to the entire left. Thank you. Francis, thank you. Um,
Yeah, I, I, it's terrible that we're, we're not all able to clap for each other. And at the end of this, we're all going to clap for each other. <laughs> um, uh, so um, our next speaker is Marta. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. And I, I just would say it's a pleasure and an, and an honor to be here and to hear the, it's been so moving today, uh, all day, to hear the tributes to Josh, to his teaching, his mentorship, uh, um, and his scholarship, of course, which is what we're discussing in this panel. Um, I, I would say that I, I don't know when I met Josh, but I know that I heard about Josh a long time ago, uh, and that's when word came to the Gutman household that this new American Social History Project was, um, was in formation. And, and all I would like to say, I just would like to make one comment on that count and to say to Mark Kagan, wherever he is in, in Zoom world, that to, to, to say that working class New York is Herbert Gutman's, is Josh's Herbert Gutman's book, well, uh, my father would be so honored uh, um, to, to, to be able to hear that. So it may be somewhere uh, he is. So I would like to share my screen. Great, okay, so it's time for transformational generational change with our city, our country and our planet in the midst of multiple emergencies, excuse me. And yet I approach the provocation of this session to define a progressive urbanism with some skepticism. Community identity and of course place are key factors in organizing social movements in the United States. And thank you, Francis, for leading us in that direction. Um, but I wonder if urbanism as a physical proposition, as a thing in and of itself can be progressive. What is a progressive plan or architectural design? I raise these questions because my field of architecture and architecture history is replete with examples of what my students at Spitzer, at Spitzer School of Architecture call perpetual saviorism. An architect asserts with certainty that a technical, moral, environmental, or aesthetic vision is the answer to urban poverty, climate change, racial inequality, or poor health, you name it. And all too often, communities of color are left to cope with dubious outcomes, with the detritus of good intentions. In this egregious, whoops. The, well, not sure what's going on, but this egregious example comes to mind. IS-201, the award-winning middle school that abuts the railroad viaduct in central Harlem. Parents so loathed the windowless design that they struck the racially segregated school in on opening day in 1966. It was a key moment in the movement for community control of public education in New York City. No wonder that no surprise that this school and this strike figure in Josh Freeman's working class New York, the historian and the book we celebrate today and earlier today. Brian Purnell noted the chapter in which uh, Josh discusses, uh, discusses the strike. So I'd like to set aside progressive urbanism with its implied focus on outcome and try out instead Josh's concept, laboratory for a social urbanism. My goal is to shift our attention from outcome or intent to purpose and process. Now, I don't know why my slides aren't moving. Okay, there we go, great. Uh, Josh used this phrase, laboratory for social urbanism, to describe this city when it crackled with the political energy of a mobilized working class in the years following World War II. He insisted that, quote, New York became a laboratory for social urbanism, committed to an expansive welfare state, racial equality, and popular access to culture and education, close quote. The architectural landscape was utterly transformed when big labor, big government, and big business cooperated to facilitate urban redevelopment 
in neighborhoods were remade, were made over with mass housing, schools, playgrounds, parks, and health center centers. Will New York become a laboratory for a social urbanism once again? The federal government, my question is not an idle one. The federal government, we hope, is poised to invest trillions of dollars in infrastructure, technology, the environment, education, healthcare, in childcare, in what is already being called the Biden New Deal. As David Sanger pointed out recently in the Times, the president and his team are counting on government, not markets, to jumpstart the economy, address climate change, and remediate the enduring inequalities that are imprinted in the everyday settings of cities. He has, in Sanger's word, words, made a bet that the trauma of the coronavirus pandemic and the social and racial inequalities that it underscored have changed the political center of gravity for the nation. Let's imagine for the moment that Biden succeeds, that New York receives its fair share of federal dollars, and that the city follows up with widespread investment in the working class neighborhoods that Josh describes so beautifully in his book. How do we seize this moment and use this money to imagine a different way of living together in a post pandemic world? I suggest we start by mobilizing urban space to serve young people and their caretakers, so often women and of color and so harmed in the past year. It has become a truism that the pandemic has exposed the structural dimensions of poverty in working class neighborhoods, the searing imprints of racism and sexism. And this spatial focus broadly construed on care, women and children would be one way in which a Biden New Deal could respond to urgent needs and avoid even correct the failures of FDR's New Deal and LBJ's Great Society. We know the promise of rights-based liberalism has yet to be fulfilled for all New Yorkers because as Josh pointed out, Cold War politics stained with McCarthyism disrupted FDR's agenda. And for no group did racial discrimination riven with Jim Crowism taint architectural outcomes more than for children of color. Take public schools. There is considerable work to do in the Biden New Deal if we concur with Mark Twain that out of the public school grows the greatness of a nation. Progressive New Yorkers acted in the spirit of Twain's bold claim when they organized a citizens committee in the early 1930s to jumpstart a municipal housing authority. This committee, the city's first slum clearance committee, advanced its agenda by surveying public schools like this one and other amenities for children in the 14 working class neighborhoods where it proposed to locate low cost housing. Harlem areas six, seven, and eight on the map was one of them. The SEC recorded the age, location, and utilization of schools. The SEC documented local institutions, including health centers, churches, and daycare centers. The SEC also surveyed parks and playgrounds and suggested locations for new ones. These meticulous maps coordinated by Catherine Lansing, the lead social worker uh, on the committee, reveal working class communities at the fine grained scale, at the scale in which she knew that everyday life was organized, lived and experienced by children. So the SEC affirmed the desirability of slum clearance, hoping to deliver a better life for working class families, including of color. Is this an example of the flaw of certainty that my students pointed out, of perpetual saviorism? Perhaps, yet it also represents, I believe, a genuine achievement. The survey is a rare example of a moment when architects and planners, prodded by women and social workers, studied neighborhoods from the perspective of children, considering schools, recreation, and public health in conjunction with housing. And tragically, this childish perspective was lost as these maps and surveys were transformed into hard-nosed plans driven by economic and political calculus, 
and profound disregard for children of color and disrespect for the places where they lived. So only a few public schools were constructed in Harlem during the New Deal. One preservation study puts the number at three, a stark contrast to the 160 schools that were built in Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island. Otherwise, old fashioned, poorly maintained, overcrowded public schools remained the norm in Harlem. This one, uh, PS39 on East 125th Street, is one that confounded the right to a good education that FDR proclaimed all children deserve in 1944. The oldest building on the site, the squat three-story structure in the photo on your left, was constructed in 1848. And the Amsterdam News labeled public schools like this one firebrands, extremely unsafe for human uh, occupation. During World War II and following, the Board of Education crafted an ambitious plan, a $200 million program to build schools, 274 in all across the city. And yet the shortage of schools of seats for students in schools in Harlem increased after the war as thousands of units of housing were built in the area. And here's an example of how a construction program twisted by racism failed Harlem. In 1947, Mayor William O'Dwyer broke ground for PS 133 in Harlem. It was the first public school to be built in Manhattan after the war. And the low-slung three-story building clad in light brick and arranged in a U-shape is an example of what Lewis Mumford called sound vernacular modern architecture. And Nikhil showed us examples of others in Philadelphia uh, and, in, and in Europe. This school was placed across Fifth Avenue from a WPA playground, opened in 1936, and two blocks south of Abraham Lincoln houses. The public housing project proposed in 1943 in concert with Riverton houses was designed by the African-American architect, Vertner Woodson Tansy in conjunction with a, a couple of other practitioners. Unusually, three city agencies, three city agencies, here's the slide, right, okay. Unusually, three city agencies planned a playground, a public school, and public housing in concert with one another. An example of social urbanism? Perhaps yes, but progressive? Not so much. The construction only came in response to the social uprisings of 1935 and 1943, and within three years of opening its doors, PS 133 had won the dubious distinction of being the most crowded school in Manhattan. Designed for 868 students, 1,800 children were packed into the school in 1952. Students in a modern, up-to-date school faced nearly all the same problems that compromised older schools in Harlem. Overcrowded classrooms, double sessions, ineffective teaching, and increased problems with discipline. An overcrowded classroom is a menace to the learning process that prevents the taxpayer from getting his full return, the Amsterdam News editorialized in 1953. It is high time that we fully recognize this fact in Harlem and make definite plans to do something about it. Agreed, uh, some several decades later. So Teddy Cruz, an architect whom I admire, asked recently, could there be a pandemic variant that changes the way we live together? What is the public world that we will make when we venture outside again? Can we project something different? Can we learn to live with closeness, proximity, and nearness? And I would add, can we untangle the intersection of architecture with racism, sexism, and childism while steering clear of the perpetual saviorism that has clouded progressive urbanism in the past. The working class neighborhood is the place to start from, to locate a laboratory for social urbanism that takes as first priority, a space driven racial equity agenda for working class children and their caregivers. Learning from the New Deal, a survey could assess playgrounds, schools, small parks, and daycare centers revealing persistent gaps across the city. The New Deal set benchmarks, a roadmap for social urbanism, even if racial policies ensured they were never met. Today, we need a new map. 
and to execute this work, the Civilian Conservation Corps could be revived as a multiracial student union, employing urban youth to frame survey goals and objectives, to execute the survey work, and perhaps even to build. As we start to build back better to appropriate Biden's phrase, we can begin to dismantle the systemic racism and sexism that plague architecture and the allied professions and enact the pledge that my students at City College make each year at graduation. And it is to transmit the city not only less, but greater, better, and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. Thank you. Marta, thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for that fantastic presentation and that pledge that your students take is so moving. <laughs> um, <laughs> we should all take that pledge. Um, uh, our last speaker uh, is Kefui. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Penny. And um, thanks for the rest of the, to the rest of the panelists for um, joining me. Uh, I'm to start by saying that I'm incredibly honored to be part of this conference and panel and to have the chance to celebrate the work of my colleague, Josh Freeman, who's been a tremendous sort of source of support and inspiration and wisdom uh, for, for me and many, many others at SLU. So um, in terms of my remarks, I've taken a very liberal approach to the, the panel prompt um, read. I, I didn't do my homework <laughs> um, and decided to focus as much on you know, my own vision of a progressive metropolis um, or how to get there um, as on what Josh's book lets us say uh, about that vision and the city more generally. Um, and since I'm on the urban studies side of the SLU house, I thought that focus on the city would be really appropriate. Uh, uh, to do that, I'll start with a kind of more personal account or story. Almost every year in my intro to urban studies class, I assign a short chapter from a book by the economist uh, Edward Glazer. The book is called The Triumph of the City, how our city's great, how, how our greatest invention makes us richer, smarter, greener, healthier, and happier. Um, it was published in 2011. It was a New York Times bestseller. And the book is a pay-in to both the city and the free market. Of course, I, I don't assign the book because I agree with the conclusions. Um, I assign it because the book is a, an absolute masterclass in mystification. As one of my students said, it's a dazzling display of neoliberal capitalist propaganda, but done really, really well. In the chapter that I assign, Glazer focuses on the problem of urban poverty. Here's a sample. The presence of poverty in cities from Rio to Rotterdam, Glazer argues, reflects urban strength, not urban weakness. In a free society, people choose where to live, either by moving or simply staying in the place of their birth. A city's population tells you about what that city offers. Salt Lake City is full of Mormons because it's a good place to be a Mormon. London has many bankers because it's a good place to manage money. Cities like Rio have plenty of poor people because they are relatively good places to be poor. After all, even without any cash, you can still enjoy Ipanema Beach. With few exceptions, almost every student hates the chapter and dislikes the book. At the same time, just as many struggle to articulate why they hate it, why it rubs them the wrong way. It's pablum, but what exactly makes it pablum? Over the course of the class, we explore all the things that, chap that the chapter works to mystify and obscure. Rather than a free society where people choose where to live, like Mormons in Salt Lake City or bankers in London, we explore the degree to which people's choices are invariably constrained by forces well outside of their control. Agricultural mechanization, land enclosures, privatization, global trade policy, economic restructuring, war, famine, famine in a world that has plenty of food for all of us. The students get it. 
But there is one line in the chapter that always seems to trip students up. The line comes toward the end of the chapter. Here, Glazer makes a rather compelling point. When we judge cities, he says, we should judge them not by their poverty, but rather by their track record and helping people move up. If a city is attracting waves of less fortunate people, helping them succeed, watching them leave, and then attracting new disadvantaged migrants, it is succeeding at one of society's most important functions. Even for students who hate the book, very few disagree with its general sentiment. A good city, a progressive city, is at best a machine for upward mobility. Curiously enough, unions, strikes, work stoppages, housing struggles barely make an appearance in Glazer's narrative. And so one of the pleasures of the last seven years at CUNY is to see how Josh's book, Working Class New York, has helped hundreds of students at SLU, many of them work, working class students, see through the pablum and mystification of a book named by the Financial Times and McKinsey as one of the best books of 2011. As Josh argues for millions of New Yorkers in the post-war decades, it was not the city as some abstract super organic force that helped people secure a dignified life, but a mobilized working class. Cities by themselves don't make us richer, greener, healthier, and happier. That happens through struggle and active mobilization. So, so back to the panel topic, what, what vision of the city we should guide the progressive left. The message from Josh's book is clear. It's a vision where working class New Yorkers are not only a force to be reckoned with, but are in the driver's seat. Of course, that vision you know, taken from the book also has a Janus-faced quality. The class solidarity of the immediate post-war raised wages and improved living standards, but it also created the conditions for class mobility and the chance to finally leave the old neighborhood behind. To quote Marshall Berman, uh, for many, the moral imperative of the social democratic city was sadly, but understandably, get out, schmuck, get out. Rereading Josh's book in 2001 was really illuminating, but uh, both because of you know, how much has changed, but also how much has stayed the same. Uh, so first the change. Today, working class New Yorkers are more likely to be wearing scrubs and rubber gloves than they are to be wearing uh, tool belts or uh, long, longshoremen's hooks. And, and for many, while the struggle is you know, still over wages and hours, it is also about classification and, and workplace fissuring. In many industries, uh, subcontracting has been taken to almost rhizomatic extremes. The same fissuring happens in the rental market. Who exactly is my landlord? Is it BlackRock, a BlackRock subsidiary, a subsidiary of a BlackRock subsidiary contracted out to a third party LLC, a third party, party LLC with zero employees based in Nauru or Delaware? And, and who of those is actually responsible for fixing the damn boiler? And yet despite these changes, for many, the vision of a progressive city remains the same. Indeed, the post-war CIO program of housing, rent controls, public education, anti-discrimination, it all still seems like a, a, a good deal. More schoolhouses, less jails, more books, less arsenals, more learning, less vice, more leisure, less greed, and let's make it sustainable. The question remains how to get there. Here again, Josh's book is, is useful. So in chapter 15, he describes the development of the Municipal Assistance Corporation, a bond issuing authority tasked with reforming the city's budgetary practices, i.e. tightening the belt and enforcing austerity. As Josh details in the book, the authority worked to undermine and destroy an entire sweep of institutions and conventions that had defined New York as a social democratic polity. Um, one of the most more interesting examples of the kind of belt tightening was the demand from the uh, Municipal Assistance Corporation that the MTA raise transit fares. Of course, the MTA was an autonomous agency and fares had little to do with the city budget. 
so the demand didn't make any practical sense. But the fare increase was not about practical sense or fiscal need. As Josh argues, it was about political symbolism. It was a visible sign of the city's willingness to sacrifice a sacred cow, namely a 35 cent transit fare. Why bring this up? Well, because symbolism, especially when backed by force, works both ways. And it seems like there's a lesson there. Neoliberalism, capital, neoliberal capitalism, after all, has its own sacred cows. What would, mean, what would it mean to sacrifice those? Better yet, which ones are worth targeting for slaughter? What's curious about 2021 is that the answer is already here. Over the course of the last year, COVID has gone some way in undermining the very social arrangements that uh, for many appeared natural. Deficits, who cares? What are those? Work requirements for Medicaid, which have, had only been proposed in Kentucky in 2019. Now that's insane and everyone agrees. In June of last year, the Federal Reserve agreed to purchase up to 500 billion in municipal uh, bonds issued by states, cities, and other taxing authorities. They can do that. We can fund the operating and capital costs of municipalities through the Fed. Really? Poor Abe Bean, if only he had known. What else is possible? What important, more, most importantly, Corona showed that grocery store workers, bus drivers, nurses, wage workers are the keystone of our civilization. So what I'm saying, I'm saying that in less than a year, many of neoliberalism's sacred cows caught corona and died in the pasture. The question is then, how do we make sure they stay dead? And not just mostly dead, which means that they're slightly alive, but all dead. And that's a, re that's a reference to Princess Bride for the, for the people out there. In the last six months, there have been a number of proposals advanced in Washington that are gaining traction, and many of them are incredibly positive. The PRO Act, the Green New Deal for Public Housing, a new infrastructure bill. Uh, in this context, I think Josh's book is really, really important. We should ask, if passed, what sorts of working class institutions will be created or strengthened in their wake? Who will these institutions be accountable to Lesson from Josh's book is that at least in New York, a decent home, a decent wage, and a decent, decent hospital bill were secured through working class mobilizations and institutions. And thus the task, to paraphrase Josh, of turning the ghost of working class New York back into a living, breathing organism will require building institutions that are accountable to workers, making sure the sacred cows of neoliberalism stay all dead, not mostly dead. And it may ultimately require parsing the difference between a city that promotes class solidarity and one that promotes upward class mobility, which both seem desirable, but somehow very, very different. So that, those are my comments. Thanks, thanks, Josh, if you're listening. <laughs> I'm so sure that Josh is listening. Um, so first, I want to just thank all of our panelists. Kefwi, that was fantastic. And everybody, thank you um, for all of the remarks that, that you just shared with us. Um, and uh, I want to give you all an opportunity to respond to some of the great ideas that uh, that were put forward today. I mean, Nikhil spoke about the possibilities for a uh, you know, so public social housing that's green um, and the history of that and the possibilities in the, in the future. Uh, Francis speaking to the power of rent strikes um, and how those could be uh, initiated and morale, the morale boosting um, aspects of them. Um, Marta spoke to the necessity of, of you know, creating child-centered public spaces and how the professions um, in urban planning can, can and in the past have successfully allied with communities to create that kind of um, bottom-up child-centered public spaces. Um, and then Kefwi left us with a lot of questions about what it means to have 
a class, a, a, a city, any city that is going to keep people there um, and give them the decent home and, and uh, hospital bill <laughs> um, and how we can achieve that uh, today, which is, is really kind of our, our question. And he answers it in part by the calling out of the neoliberal um, uh, consensus that we have been living under for so long and that we see cracking right now. Um, so I, first to any of you, if, if you have any comments or questions on each other's panels. I would like to say something. Okay, Francis and then Nikhil. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Particularly with, with regard to something that Nikhil and I both brought up, which was public housing. Uh, but it's, what, what I wanna say about public housing is true more generally of government programs that aid the poor. They are, in, in the first instance, they are very stingy, very not enough money is provided. All sorts of criteria are introduced with regard to the administration of the program, which make it a humiliating process. And then the program has a bad reputation. So, which redounds to an image of the public sector and especially the parts of the public sector that provide services to marginalized groups uh, as kind of disgusting. We don't like that. We like market programs which celebrate upward mobility, celebrate fancy, fancily dressed people, uh, but I think that it, it would be very useful to promote academic work, which tells the truth about public housing. What is that truth? Well, it begins by showing how the real estate industry strangled that program, forced it to become distasteful, insisted that the buildings had to be built to last forever, but the apartments could only be painted in green, green or beige, and that there would be no doors on the showers. Uh, so, and look at what we do to welfare, to, to a program that is supposed to provide nutrition and rental subsidies to the poorest of women and children, but only on condition that they go through hoops to establish their eligibility, that they degrade themselves in order to get the little bit of support that they get. There, there has been work on some of the ways in which the welfare state has been enlisted in the incrimination of the welfare state, but not enough. And in particular, public housing has been a lot we have allowed it to be slandered in a way that I think is so inexcusable and helps account for why we have destroyed it. We don't have any housing and we blow up public housing projects. Public housing projects whose tenants can, with support and encouragement, reminisce about how wonderful it was when they were kids. Um, Nikhil. I, one, I just, I just completely agree with what um, Professor Piven just said. I just thought that was, I mean, it's, it's very true. And there's, there, I mean, there have been, um, there's some books I've read that, that have made it, you know, have brought that home to me or your, the point that actually it was, you know, there were the people, the, the fondness and actually the, and, and in some instances, the, the, the real quality of some of the stuff that was built um, of course, the, it was neglected, disinvested in, there were restrictions, in, and then it, we, we know there was what, what we, I mean, exa it's exactly the story you told, but, you know, things like there's a book about Chicago public housing, when public housing was paradise, and, um, you know, and even, and, and some books about NYCHA, that housing that have suggest, shown all the ways in which it has fundamentally succeeded, I mean, with all the you know, taking for grant, granted all the things that we know 
that the authority and federal housing have done to it. But um, so I totally agree. I, I guess I have a, I have a question for um, for I, I in in it sort of touches on um, Professor Piven and Professor uh, Otto about both of your your presentations. Um, Kafwi, you, you uh, sorry, we, we as some of us know each other, and so I, I slip between names. Um, That's fine. So um, the uh, the the um, you mentioned who there was that question you were asking. Who exactly is my landlord? And this is this is a good question because it it touches on um, on the on the notion of a rent strike. Of course, this is true when you strike at a workplace. Who is my who owns my hotel? You know who owns my I mean, I feel like we know we 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 confront this situation all the time. Um, but one, I want to pose a, a kind of parallel idea, which is that we the landlord tenant relationship is an unequal one. Landlords actually, when they do run into trouble, have mortgages, and mortgages are easier to negotiate. They're easier to change. Not I'm not saying it's good. It's just it's it's a different situation than when you are a tenant. You have more you have more abilities. You usually have more assistance. Um, the the thing that one thing we do know, however, is you do know who controls your water, and you do know who controls your electricity, and you do know who controls all your heat. You do know who controls basically all your utilities. And in addition to the vast amount of rental debt that we've accumulated during this crisis, we've accumulated enormous amounts of utility debt, and those utilities are in some measure regulated by at a state level, usually by public utility commissions, and so. There is a, which doesn't necessarily mean that all of his debt can be canceled, although I sort of, I believe that it should be. It's just, there's often like technical reasons that that's not true, um, which, I mean, there could, there could be federal investment that would help cancel it, but just actual like forgiveness. Uh, I've tried, I was trying to figure out if we could forgive it in Pennsylvania. Um, the, but so one question is, how do people, I'm wondering what people think about the relationship. There's a landlord tenant relationship, but there's also the tenant, the utility relationship. Um, and, and this also brings into mind, I think, some of our broader environmental commitments because the energy source in your home that, I mean, there's just no more intimate connection between you and natural gas, between you and, you know, the, you know, and, and, and the like. I mean, so I just wonder, and your, your heating costs, weatherization, these are all things that affect us will affect us more under climate change. So I just wonder if, the, if, and if, if either of you really, anyone on the panel would be willing to speak to just utilities and how we should regard utilities in, in progressive urbanism. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, Kefri or Marta, uh, if you guys want to come in on any of these, I saw your hand up, Kefri, yeah. I think it's a, I think it's a great point, Anna. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's a great point and a, a great, question, um, you know, from, on the, from the political side, I think organizing around utilities can be, um, you know, can, can, can work or, or can be galvanizing or catalyzing. Um, I know at least in Poughkeepsie where I live, um, there was an organization that, you know, organized around or against shutoffs um, during, during the winter. I mean, pe people, you know, Utility companies, uh, you know, you know, can and will shut off heat in in cold climates if, uh, if they don't get paid, and it people have a visceral reaction against that. Well, because it's inhumane, <laughs> um, and so um, I think there there is there's uh, opportunities, but also you know differences. I'm just thinking. Of, Francis was saying with, uh, you know, with the rent, I mean, you can withhold rent and still have a place. I mean, the police eventually may come, um, but it's hard <laughs> to go without heat or water or electricity um, as a, you know, if you're refusing to, to, to pay. At the same time, I think there's, you know, all this talk, talk about, you know, public, you know, public, public ownership of, you know, energy and moving you know, um, even moving the, these quasi public private partnerships to fully, you know, public um, agencies, which, uh, you know, which I, which I think is great, 
especially if we want to move away from natural, gra natural gas or, um, or you know, talk about the, the, you know, the energy grid and, and drawing from uh, solar, solar and wind. And, and so you do what you can in that sense, combine kind of class uh, concerns with not having shutoffs, having cheap energy, um, with environmental concerns, um, with some sort of state kind of uh, intermediary. So I think it's a great, great point and great, I wish I knew more about the kind of different mobilizations outside of the limited ones I know around public power and, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, the campaigns against, um, you know, various uh, natural well, gas. If there is a, a real protest going on and people are angry enough, uh, there are always those people who know how to reconnect the utilities. And that's what happens in actual rent strikes, for example, uh, where people are galvanized and angry. They reconnect uh, the electricity and the water. You know, this kind of this, this kind of action can be rough, and you have to be prepared to defend it. Oh, I'd stay away from gas line. That's really <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Marta, I saw you also wanted to come in. Yeah, just with regard to the infrastructure question, it's a central problem in architecture and design schools. Is to figure out um, is to figure out how to lessen the use of all forms of of water, of energy, of um, of of the like, and 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 the to lessen or to lessen or render more efficient. I mean, we when we think of we think we can think of the immediate actions to organize to protest the cost of certain systems or the absence of them. But at a certain moment, we're not going to have any. Right? We are going to be out of water period. And so the question of thinking long range in terms of organizing as well as and maybe not so long range, but more immediate range is, is really pretty is really is really quite critical. And, and so many of our of our buildings and of our our systems in New York are just, you know, they're just old, they're antiquated and they need to they need to be upgraded, modernized and and replaced. One can think, for instance, of the one pipe sanitary sewer system that we have in which storm water and sanitary water are combined and not separated, uh, um, which is uh, a, a, an enormous uh, problem in terms of conserving water costs, in terms of pollution, and, and that's just one minor, one, one, not minor, one, one point. One could imagine what the um, fixing of that system would produce in terms of empowering workers, right? Uh, employing them to, to make uh, two pipe systems in our city streets could be pretty, pretty amazing, uh, pretty amazing project. I just, I wanted to pick up on a, what I thought perhaps was a difference uh, in between the points that Francis and, and Nikhil were making about housing and, and I, and about housing provision. Um, uh, and then, and then also to, to add on to that, and which is that I, I, I firmly believe that this country needs to invest um, in fixing the public housing that we have uh, um, and in repairing it and in rendering it useful uh, and improving, improving it for the tenants who live in so many of the units, certainly not in continuing to blow, blow up apartment buildings, but, um, but also in keeping that, those buildings public, uh, um, I believe so much money was uh, was wasted uh, and lost when we went from, in the Nixon era, from investing in building housing to supporting rent for or offering vouchers vouchers for rent. And I, I don't I don't agree with that. Uh, um, I didn't, didn't agree with that decision when it happened at that point when I was then a young architect working in in designing homeless shelters for. Uh, unhoused New Yorkers, as we now call them, uh, though, although not then, and and it seems to me that that it is one of the great pieces of public infrastructure in the city that is the public housing uh, that we have. I think certainly when I was uh, uh, in the 80s, the the statistic that was offered was 
if New York were to meet the list of, of, of um, people who have signed up for public housing, New York would, NYCHA would have to build, would have to double its capacity of housing, right? So there's a demand for publicly owned, publicly maintained decent housing. And, and, and I firmly believe that's where, where we, need, uh, we need to direct our, our attentions uh, um, for the future and other colleagues who work in housing and housing history, I think would, have, would agree with me there. Nick Bloom, Matt Lasner are among the people I know whose work I respect on this issue enormously. Um, I would also say that when we plan housing, and this was part of the point of my paper, is that we don't, we plan housing, we plan schools, we plan playgrounds, we plan parks independently of one another. And we end up creating crises because we don't think comprehensively. Uh, um, and so, uh, and, and, and so you, 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 you know, Harlem had the most public housing units built in the nation at one point in the mid 1950s. And yet the number, the quantity of schools that were built to educate students next who lived in, the, in this housing didn't in any way satisfy that need. And this produces crises that uh, damaged the working class for sure, both at the time of um, the time of the experience and through uh, through the longevity of lives. Earlier um, today, we heard Rob Nixon's um, phrase, slow violence and concept uh, described in terms of um, the ways in which children are damaged through uh, police violence. This was in LaShawn Harris's amazing paper in the session Martha Biondi chaired and which he spoke about uh, um, the murders of the police, murders by the police of African-American African-Americans dating in this city back to the 1960s and before and the consequence that these kinds of actions take on, on children uh, um, and how long lasting that, that violence, uh, violence is on, on, on black bodies and black minds and, and black emotions. And I would say we can also talk about the absence of seats in schools, about the absence of playgrounds, about the absence of adequate housing as executing of slow violence on on uh, families on families of color, and that that um, that encourages us, I think, then to to reimagine a planning process as one that that is rather more um, rather more integrated uh, than it is at the present moment. So, Marta, thank you. Um, I'm going to raise two great questions that came in from the audience, and we might even have time for more if. I mean, there are more, uh, but I'll raise these two. Um, the first is a question about rent strikes. Um, are, are poor landlords the folks who would be hurt in rent strikes? Would big corporate landlords survive and grow stronger out of this rent crisis by buying up the properties that working class and poor property owners have to sell in order to pay um, the debts from their taxes and insurance. So kind of a question about the strategy of, of rent strikes. Um, a second question came in, uh, will technology like Zoom, here we are, and, um, and so many corporations and employers saying that they want to continue to employ workers remotely, decimate the population of cities as people move to open landscapes? Have lockdown policies contributed to this quote escape from places like New York City? And finally, what will this population shrinkage and permanent loss of professional workers do to the tax base of the city and the public sector jobs that depend on that revenue? So these are some uh, big questions for our panelists to consider. Um, I'd be glad to sort of take up the, the question about, uh, about, um, about remote work and, and sort of the implications of, of, of that and people possibly leaving the city. I, you know, I think this is, it's, it, 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 it's a funny thing because it actually, it's, it's, it, it, it had, it was a trend that predates the pandemic, which was the reduction of the amount of office space and amount of people, amount of office space allotted per worker. Um, it just was, you know, when this is, when people thought about how their cubicles were getting smaller, I mean, just this kind of like folk 
feeling about people just in their workplaces. That was actually true. Your, your work, you were getting less and less space in every workplace over time um, because they're just, it's real estate's expensive and companies don't want to spend on it. And they don't want to spend on their workers. Um, and you really started to see this though in, in overall that the trend started to feel more present when people, when spending less money, move, some, some corporations and organizations moving for their operations from, from suburbs or, you know, or, or like kind of corridors around, you know, Princeton, New Jersey or Northern Virginia to cities, you started to see the just abandonment of all these office parks and things like that. And so that was, that's all part of this, this broader movement. I mean, it's all, un, there's, there are different reasons for it, but so now it's just hugely accelerated because um, this remote work experiment has taken place for, for many people, obviously not all, uh, or not even, you know, not, not many workers who kept a lot of things to, you know, going during the pandemic. But we, we um, as a result, more organizations are more going to be familiar with it. And so the huge binge in commercial real estate that we've seen, you know, in, it's predominantly in cities like New York, but it, in other places you actually did have um, the conversion of, of commercial real estate to residential real estate, con, you know, office to condo conversion. Um, it's that, that seems like gravely at risk. And I don't want to, I don't want um, to put any kind of judgment on it yet. I think there's also still things that we have to kind of understand or learn about it. But it's not necessarily the case that that was a good thing that we were all building tons of office space and just and pile you know and it was never it was considered never very clear that we should have these giant downtowns full of office spaces. That's that's a, a it might be a peculiar way to design a city. I mean, Jane Jacobs certainly thought so, but other people thought so. Um, it is also unusual in in a city in an urban context outside of. I mean, it's now true globally, but. The United States, the notion of a downtown is an American word. Um, and so it's, I mean, these are just, these are just ways that we maybe just, we want to reserve judgment on it. I mean, I just, I'll, I'll just, I'll just say that much that like whether this, this, the, the very notion of how we use these buildings, the fact that they were just designed, devoted to this particular kind of work, not used fully half the time, you know, I mean, or more, you know, more than that. And, and so um, I just want to, to, to point that out, that that actually is, it's equivocal what that means. I mean, there are all these implications, of course, people leaving, I, I, I respect that, but I just want to say on, just on that narrow point of what, these, what we've done to our cities with these giant office spaces, we should, we should maybe be circumspect about whether that's, that's entirely bad. Yeah, and certainly in New York City, there's talk of you know, a lot of the office spaces becoming the affordable housing that we need, which is the basis for being able to have a working class or progressive city um, is the fact that workers can actually live here. Um, other folks who want to come in on these, these questions. I, I wanna deal yeah. with the, uh, there's a problem always in a protest movement. There's a problem in controlling responses to the crisis that the protest creates. If cooperation of one kind or another is withdrawn, there is a kind of dysfunction, institutional dysfunction, and one can imagine powerful interests taking advantage of that to impose their own solution, which is the hypothetical that's introduced by the questioner. If, if relatively poor landlords are losing their ability to maintain their buildings if equity private equity companies are buying up real estate and if that's a response to our rent strike that's not what we want but so yeah if to the extent possible we should also contemplate trying to influence the response to the crisis that the protest movement creates that's true of a strike as well of a labor strike as well. It's true of any crisis that's created by, in a sense, people in the street. Thank you, Francis. Any um, other? Yeah, I just wanted to echo Nikhil's comments about being circumspect about predicting what is going to happen with regard to office space, um, uh, people coming back or not coming back to the city. We know after 9-11, there was a prediction that New York would collapse and fall apart. And that's not exact, that's not what happened at all. So I, 
I think um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure what will happen in the future. I think that our society will be profoundly changed, has been profoundly changed by what we've experienced in the past year. And, and that, and I hope that out of that, it's out of this experience can come a better way of being together, right? And, and if it means with one of the outcomes of that is rethinking single purpose uses downtowns, that would be a good thing, right? <laughs> that would be, that would be fantastic. Uh, um, if it can afford new ways of thinking about moving around the city, you know, that would also be great. But uh, um, of people moving, moving by foot, riding bikes, uh, um, meeting each other in, in new and, and un, unanticipated ways, that would be a great outcome. Um, if we could get a better public health system out of this, that would also be something we could, we could look forward to. So I don't think they're all doomsday narratives at all. I, I just, I, I think it, it, it's been a hard year, the long 2020, as we're now calling it, right? Um, it's not over yet. It's been a long, it's been a hard, a hard, hard year, but I, I, I'm optimistic, cautiously, that we can, we can make a better world. I have to be, right? I can't, I have to be. <laughs> yeah. um, Kefwina, do you wanna come in? Well, I, 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 on the Zoom, on the Zoom question or the uh, mass exodus question, I mean, I think there's, there's many jobs that can't be Zoomified, bus drivers, transit workers. Um, and so, um, but there are some non-essential, like me. <laughs> I'm up in Poughkeepsie. I've been teaching via this screen for now all over a year. Um, and it's interesting because the, the, the question is, the, the question for me was what it does for uh, workers. I, I had a number of students in my class who work for the city. Um, I think one or two have worked actually for NYCHA who, um, who were working from home, you know, they, they're based in New Jersey, and uh, they loved it. And they were saying to their, their boss that, you know, they had been asking for something similar for years. They're saying, you know, I would love to be able to work from home uh, one day or two days a week. And, um, and you know, the, they were told, oh, it's not possible. We can't do it. And, um, and now, now, now they can, <laughs> and they they see what what is possible. So, on one hand, that I don't think that's good for the city, <laughs> good for the city life. But it, for some workers, obviously, it, it shows, you know, some you know the the various options that are available if um, if uh, you know an agency or a company really wants to to put the resources in. Um, I remember there was actually a master's student um, I had who did a, their final project on a um, working from home as a, you know, as part of the collective bargaining. This was well before <laughs> all of this happened. And it was, it was, it was a, a really interesting piece. And he did surveys of people and he saw, he heard from a lot of people that they like to, to work from home. At the same time, employers, you know, the question of, and this is probably Nikhil is field about discipline and ability to control a workspace and work productivity. It becomes a conflict over, like everything, over labor and capital, <laughs> over control of the workspace, over the work process, where the work gender roles, is. gender roles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All these things come, become, you know, are collided in these in this moment, and so. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, so it's a long way of saying I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that indeterminate note, I think that the stakes of the panel that you all have spoken within, you know, whether the success of a progressive urbanism will also help to answer this question, because if we make a city a place we want people to be, people will be here. Um, and uh, I want to thank you all again for this fantastic contributions to this panel. I want to thank the audience um, for your questions and uh, for your attention to uh, the work of Josh and all the work that uh, his work has inspired.